On this episode of the DIY Writer Podcast, I have a very special guest. He is the author of Torn Veil. We also don't know a whole lot about him, so he's going to explain what his book is about. And to protect his identity and for his own safety, we have blocked out the screen so you cannot see his face. I'd like to introduce Gregory R. Marshall. Gregory, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Not too bad. Do you mind if I call you Greg? No, go for it. All right, cool. So I... I uh, haven't actually read your book, but I read through the book blurb and, you know, on, on several levels, this one hits me. Um, I noticed that you're, you know, you're uh, categorized in occult horror, political fiction, uh, and, uh, you know, those are a couple of things very near and dear to my heart, um, especially in the writing world. Uh, so... I would like you to, you know, kind of explain what you're doing with this this book, Torn Veil. Well, so it's about an inventor who uh, has come up with something that could replace uh, fossil fuels. So he's a threat to a lot of established power. Um, everyone wants to be able to just turn on their car and go, uh, you know, to be able to save money. Uh, we all want to preserve the planet and not worry about, you know, what kind of world we're going to give to our kids and grandkids. And so this is a guy who's like the latter day Nikola Tesla. Okay. And he, he finds himself abducted, uh, you know, in a strange place. He doesn't know how he got there or who took him. And he believes that it's the work of the energy companies. But as he uh, continues to try to discern what's going on, find his way out, um, he realizes that it's a lot more than that. And there are, you know, darker designs in play for this, you know, once in a generation invention that he's come up, up with. Hmm. You know, it kind of reminds me of a movie I watched a while back with Keanu Reeves and uh, um, uh, Morgan Freeman was in it too. Uh, that uh, Cold Fusion uh, invention that he had and then the uh, energy companies paid to uh, basically have it destroyed and fail mm -hmm. um, which was uh, you know kind of an interesting thing so you're kind of going down that that same type of line um, you know and you have several different powerful factions that uh, that you're um, attacking here with this book you know big power you got religion and you have the uh you know american economies you have your uh, big bad evil corporation um was this based on anything in particular or i mean is this uh you know uh, well i tried to i tried to model the world of the story even though it's fiction on the levels of power that we see in the real world and how layers of disinformation work um i kind of got the idea you know, both from uh, both from the legends of, you know, inventors that, that came up with, you know, water injected fuel engines and then went missing and stuff like that. Sure. that I don't know that I personally believe in, but um, I kind of uh, wanted to capture a little bit what's kind of going on with our country right now. I think it's very important to distinguish between good and bad conspiracy theory. And uh, a writer's got to tell a good story, but the best writers are willing to confront the issues of their day. And so uh, with, with the religion stuff, I'm not anti-religion. I was raised, you know, a Christian. I, I'm very sympathetic to it in a lot of ways, but we have seen that it, it's taken on a bit of a dark side in the, the U.S. Of, of late. And there are, you know, there are ways in which uh, people, uh, you know, kind of glorify and look forward to the end times and want to, you know, cast people as, as scapegoats. And this is a novel that sort of uh, speaks to that. One of the things that uh, has always kind of interested me is when you, when you hit on the disinformation part, you know, and you, and you look at, you know, especially the newscasts, which are no longer like uh, when Walter Cronkite was w reading the news and here's just the facts and make up your own mind on what you think about it or anything else. Right, right. And everybody now is trying to sway your opinion to, you know, what they think or what they believe or what's been scripted for them to say. Right. So, you know, throughout uh, history, especially the history of fiction, 
you know, that, that type of uh, motives always been attacked. And, and here again, you're, uh, you know, you're, you're taking this to a new level just because of the time that we are times that we are in the amount of media, social media and everything. It's got to be a coordinated effort, especially between news agencies, government, big companies, big technology companies, especially uh, as of late in the news, hint, hint, hint. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it, there's, there's this almost like a coordinated effort to hide the truth and give you some sort of a, a feeling that, uh, um, you know, things are all right. Or, you know, these particular things didn't happen. Don't worry about it. Here's your shiny thing over here. Don't worry about what I'm doing in the corner type thing. And it looks like you're attacking that also. Well, uh, there's, there's a lot of nuance that needs to be brought into the discussion. And I kind of feel like it's the job of writers to approach some of that and try to get the ideas out there. Yes, uh, media conglomerates, uh, the mainstream, they can have misinformation, they can have bias. Uh, but sometimes the, the other side is not doing justice to things quite so well either. Let me try to put it uh, in perspective. Okay. So on your other show, I mean, on some of your previous interviews, uh, I got the feeling that you're a little bit of a history buff, that you're in, into history, that you, you follow history. Yes. So um, it, it seems to me that uh, there's a repeated cycle where uh, you have a, a conspiracy theory that scapegoats a vulnerable faction and a, a much more powerful foundation underpinning that kind of gets away scot-free and empowers itself by having someone to blame. So if you look at the, you know, the Puritan witch hunters, they said these guys uh, that were persecuting are, are witches and warlocks and they signed a deal with the devil. Uh, with McCarthy, you believe that there was a communist conspiracy who was gonna infiltrate everything and destroy the government. With Stalin, you had a conspiracy of counter-revolutionists with Hitler was saying that the Jews are going to take over the world. With J. Edgar Hoover, you, you had uh, subversives who were plotting against America. And it, it's really, in all those cases, the people they were fighting were not the people who were in power. It was somebody else who was stoking these fears to make it seem uh, like, like the people in power weren't in power, to deflect blame away from themselves. And so Torn Veil is trying to, to uh, acknowledge some of that and get people to grapple with it in a way that's also hopefully an entertaining story. Well, you know, and I, I, I do believe that companies today, you know, they have all this infrastructure and all these different things that uh, they've invested millions and billions of dollars in, whether it be the energy companies or it be the pharmaceutical companies will actually suppress new technologies, new drugs, or, you know, things that uh, may um, come up and, and create a uh, unfair competition for them. Right. That may kill their business. And so it's a small price to pay to pay off uh, somebody in the media or, you know, uh, have a company spin something a certain way or to take that technology, buy it and kill it. I mean, we've seen that happen before. Yeah. Um, where they say all of a sudden, well, this really wasn't viable and the test results were unreliable and, you know, so on and so forth. Please take this um, or please continue using our oil or using, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, that's something that within uh, our culture today, I think we're, especially with the internet, I think we're starting to see that there are all these games in the background and all these people pulling these strings. And you're absolutely right about, um, whether it be companies or leaders or whatever, putting the targets on other uh, people's backs in order to um, not only serve as disinformation, but also a distraction against what's really happening in the world. Right. That's right. I mean, the, uh, the stuff that was fringe when I was a kid, you know, David Koresh, Timothy McVeigh, those types of ideologies are, uh, really getting more and more and more mainstream. And I think rather than worrying about that, people like to uh, blame the Illuminati or the deep state and, the, and let the real powers behind the throne completely off the hook. And so that's sort of what's, what inspired this. If you had someone who could change the world just because they had a rare mind, just because 
they came up with the idea that was going to roll things over, what would happen? How would the world receive that person? And so I think the novel was born out of that thought experiment. Okay. You know, of course, you have the big bads who have uh, taken Nick Thomas and and abducted him and put him into a, uh, you know, some sort of a, a a cell or a holding place where they can, you know, dissect what he's actually created and and uh, either use it for themselves or or kill the technology altogether, along with probably Nick, I assume. I mean, he could. It's very well that he could end up in a barrel someplace at the bottom of the ocean. Um, you know, those types of things are, are things that can possibly happen, you know, I mean, possibly probably have happened, um, several times. We just would never know it. Um, how do you think that uh, society today, um, again, with all the mediums that we have, I mean, you know, this, this type of stuff is getting harder and harder to manipulate and, and, a string a story that somebody will believe. I mean, there's, you know, Facebook can block you, Twitter can block you, but you still have the internet. You still have websites that you can create. You have all these other uh, mediums and blogs and reddits and everything else that you can try and get the proof out of there. How do you, how do you see uh, society trying to block this type of stuff going forward? Well, there's always a, there's always two sides of the coin. I can't really speak to suppress technology because I'm a, you know, I'm a writer. I'm not really a, an inventor myself. I was more interested in like the idea of what would happen. How would people respond to it and deal with it? I think in terms of social media, in terms of Reddit, we have to be careful because it's not necessarily true that we're uh, more free, that we, we have more access to information because I think many people succumb to the temptation to seal themselves in echo chambers, mm -hmm. to surround themselves with people who agree with them and will give them sound bites that make them feel better, that make them feel more comfortable. And that's why I feel like writing uh, novels, long form stuff, not tweets is so important because that's the closest thing you can get to canning an experience, to, to living somebody else's life, walking in somebody else's shoes for a time. Uh, and that's why I think the best writers, Orwell, Langston Hughes, Bradbury, T Joyce, Tolstoy, Huxley, right? You know, all those guys, they're, they're kind of revolutionary, right? They're making, they're, they're making their case through their characters. And uh, I'm not sure that people, people go for, for truth to books anymore. I think they might go to a subreddit or a YouTube page. And I think there's a danger in that if you're not really careful about it. Well, that, that's true because I, I know from uh, personal experience that there are jobs out there for uh, uh, authors and writers who, uh, who write fiction to, you know, you're, you're given a topic and here, write something on this and make it all up and then they publish it. Um, there are scripts being written of, uh, for people that are uh, creative writing techniques, basically, that have been posted out in, uh, you know, like HubSpot and uh, Medium and, you know, Reddit that are, uh, are, are opinion pieces, but they're written by ghostwriters. And there have been times when I've seen uh, gigs pop up like that, where it's like, okay, this is a disinformation type uh, campaign. And they're getting all these people, you know, paying them, you know, a couple hundred bucks to write, uh, you know, 500 words um, eloquently, but also trying to prove a point or trying to put so much information out there that actually buries the truth. Yes. Yeah, I think... I think that's a concern. I mean, more, we, we've gotten very addicted to the metrics of things, like how many posts did I make? How many likes did I get? How many views on this video? Uh, mm -hmm. You can't quantify quality. <laughs> I mean, when, when you read something good that speaks to you, you know it. Um, and, and that's very alien to uh, the, the kind of culture that we live in now. You know, you... Uh, uh just a few minutes ago brought up a, a, a plethora of, you know, famous authors that had written, you know, fantasy and in sci-fi and, uh, you know, in general fiction. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that I notice uh, of the authors that you mentioned and several other authors that weren't mentioned is that, you know, authors throughout history have always used fiction 
as a tool to depict and pick apart societal problems. You know, um, you can read a story just at, you know, at its word and say, okay, that was a fantastic story. But as if the author did the job he should have, or could have, I guess, you know, depending on, on where you're at in your author career, um, you start seeing parallels in what's happening in the, uh, you know, in current events. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's true. Um, you, you know, a great story is not going to leave you where you found it. I mean, you don't want to be grinding a political axe. That's not, not the point of it. But if you uh, read something and you think, oh, that was a nice story, like that's probably not something you're going to remember a year from now. I think um, our genre in particular, because I consider myself, you know, embedded and influenced by sci-fi and fantasy as well. I think it's in a lot of trouble uh, because I think it's gotten very fixated on tropes and uh, what sells and it's gotten formulaic and it doesn't really touch societal problems as much as, as it really should. If you look back and you look at like, let's take George Orwell yeah. and the uh, futuristic visions or uh, predictions, whatever you want to call it, um, that he placed in his writings, it's pretty bleak. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, um, literature out there that was written saying, hey, you know what, we're probably heading in the wrong direction. And this is, this is what the outcome could be, you know. 1984. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. um, Animal Farm. I mean, <laughs> those those types of uh, of uh, stories really kind of, if you really think about them on a deep level, they kind of send chills down your spine, especially when you start seeing that happen in uh, today's uh, current events. Yeah, I mean. I think dystopian fiction is supposed to be a fire bell in the night, right? It's supposed to be like, oh my God, this looks like the world where I live. I really don't like this. I want to, you know, do something and change it. When 1984, the actual date rolled around, there was a chorus of people saying, ah, oh, we're great. You know, this didn't happen. We avoided it. America, uh -huh. you know, yada, yada. And that was, of course, long before social media, before NSA leaks and, and all that kind of stuff. So it was a premature kind of celebration in a lot of ways. But now I, I don't get the sense and, you know, I read as much as I can. Maybe there's a lot that I'm missing, but I, I used to be subscribed to the uh, magazine of science fiction and fantasy. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't feel like that most of that stuff packed a lot of punch. I didn't feel, uh, you know, the way you feel when you read Harrison Bergeron or The Velt for the first time. You know, I, I just felt like these are clever stories that comfortably fit into uh, you know, ray gun fights and, you know, terraforming or whatever. And uh, that's it. And, and that's, that's really sad. I feel like we have to try to, as writers, try to do something about that. You know, one of the, um, um, one of my favorite authors is Margaret Atwood. Are you familiar with her? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I was watching an interview with her. And, you know, they're talking about, oh, my gosh, where did you come up with this for the uh, Handmaid Tale? And she said that, you know, everything that I wrote in that book was true. And she just took different pieces of history and spun it into a tale. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything that she that you see, whether you're watching the movie or read her books, and I suggest you read the books. And uh, there's a series on Hulu that's that's based on her books, but uh, it, which is excellent. But uh, um, her book depicts certain parts of human history that, you know, if they're ever repeated, I would think that people would be appalled. But then again, depending on who's in charge and how they actually spin it, you know, which is a, a, a newer term for, you know, the uh, last couple of uh, decades, um, it could feel completely, I mean, you could make the population feel completely at ease with, uh, the type of things that happen there. And that's, that's where, you know, uh, even, you know, current literature, um, can possibly be ringing a bell saying, Hey, you don't want to go there. This is what could happen. And it's your imagination that takes you in that direction saying, okay, here's the worst of the worst. Read this, be appalled and never go that direction. Yeah. I mean, 
the hope that that's the ideal. I guess what I was saying is like I feel like the Margaret Atwoods of the world are kind of rare among sci-fi and fantasy writers. I feel like there's kind of pressure to crank out, uh, you know, vampire romances and sword and sorcery that doesn't really touch on our world. That's that's an escape, and I, it kind of makes me worried. Um, you you made the point that. Uh, what would happen if it were sp spun? You know, would people really be uncomfortable with a theocracy coup type scenario? Mm -hmm. Like, right. I don't know. But if, uh, you know, the other question is, what would people do? Would they take up arms and, and rebel and risk their lives? I, I don't know. Uh, I get the feeling that uh, people aren't ready to make those types of sacrifices. And so the more that uh, a good book can wake somebody up, and uh, make it so people aren't in that kind of position someday is like, it's a vocation, it's a calling, you gotta do that. I agree. I agree with what you're, what you're saying as far as, you know, literature's place and what literature should be doing. And I think that, you know, what you're seeing now, I don't think is that uncommon. And I think it's been throughout history. I mean, we, we know Shakespeare and we know the types of things that he wrote. And, you know, and you can go from, from him forward, but there's always been those other people that either tried to copy or tried to manipulate or tried to create something that was more, you know, in the, in the dramatic or in, you know, following tropes again, just to make some money. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with trying to make money with your writing. I mean, if you're a good writer and you want to write in tropes, you know, that is, that is completely fine. Um, if you feel it in your heart of hearts that you need to write something that's going to address a conspiracy theory or address something that uh, you see where the, uh, you know, the country or the world is heading in the wrong place, by all means, write that too. Yeah, I agree. I think that, uh, everybody has a story in them. And I think that everybody can become an author or a writer or whatever. And I, the other thing that I think is that we are living in an unprecedented time where all the literature can come out. I mean, the, the advent of the, uh, you know, Amazon being probably the biggest uh, uh, component of this, um, of the indie writer, the indie author, being able to, instead of having to write, you know, 142 letters out to all these different publishers and get rejected 141 times. Mm -hmm. um, now you can just kind of, you know, hang up a shingle, write something, you know, get it edited and uh, put a cover on it and you can publish it. And then it's up to you to market it and actually, and, and actually throw that out there. And it's, you know, there are, there, it's a very lucrative market for, for some people and some people, you know, really struggled to uh, do it, but that, that uh, freedom that that gives for the aspiring writer is something that we've never seen. We've never seen the ability um, that exists now to be self-published, to be, you know, get whatever you're thinking out there, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, you know, if you have a story to tell, you can put it out there fairly, fairly quickly and fairly in fairly inexpensively, if you wish. I, I think you're right. And I think it's a, you know, a huge opportunity for people. And I hope uh, lots of people are going to, to rise to that challenge and get themselves out there. It's uh, it's scary, but it's worth it. And I, I think that's where we see because in, you know, being an indie author and, uh, and the ease of publication being an indie author nowadays are bringing people out that have never even considered writing a book because they, they didn't want the rejection or they didn't want to go through the heartache of, uh, you know, dealing with publishers. I think that what you're seeing is more people are out there telling stories and, there are a lot of people that are following tropes and there's a lot of, you know, vampire, vampire love movies or uh, movies books are all over the place. Everybody's got one. And, uh, you know, you see a, uh, um, all these genres being uh, created that, uh, that didn't exist 20 years ago. Uh, lit RPG, you know, that is one that, that, uh, um, that's a genre that I love. I can't write it, but I love it. 
you know, like I heard uh, you mention that in one of your other interviews. What what is a lit RPG? I'm I'm at a disadvantage here. Uh, have you ever read Ready Player One? No, I just I saw the movie though. Yeah, well, the movie was was pretty good, but the book is much better. Um, that that would be like a lit RPG. Or um, you're into sci-fi. How about Altered Carbon? Yeah, you know that's. Uh, that's not really that. I mean, it's more sci-fi, but uh, you know, those types of things where they kind of have that dystopian futuristic, you know, type thing. Um, lit RPG is usually somebody stuck in a, uh, uh, you know, fighting the uh, good fight in a game. Huh. Basically. Oh yeah. I mean, go to Amazon and when you publish, I mean, just, just browse through the genres. There's all sorts of things in there. You're like, what the hell is that? Oh, Okay. That makes sense. And and they're really trying to, you know, again, it's 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 all driven around the search engine and search criteria that uh that Amazon has. I mean, they're basically just a huge search engine that's that's trying to sell you stuff, but you know, they're trying to make it easier and uh, to uh categorize things so that your searches can be more refined. And so that's where these genres start uh kind of popping up. Versus well, I the think- I think mm-hmm. like making these hybrid genres and uh, and experimenting and trying to push the boundaries, that's really positive. I guess I, you know, I, I was more getting at when uh, people don't try to do that, when mm-hmm. when they think, all right, how do I follow the, you know, the formula? You know, oh, we need this type of character who will do this, who will save the kingdom from yada, yada, such and such dragon, you know, and, right. and that's mm-hmm. not all or most hopefully not most, uh, fantasy writers by a long stretch and to an extent using form. So using uh, the archetypes, the hero's journey, uh, you know, the great uh, text mm-hmm. on, on how to, to structure a story, that's great. But um, I feel when people follow the recipe, when they, they just are treating it like a cookbook to make money, that can, can kind of be pretty soul killing. Uh, you know, it can be well, pretty dangerous. Well- and that's where I'm going to kind of disagree with you from a certain perspective. And the certain perspective is when you're starting out as an author, you don't know if you're good or not. And chances are you're not. Your first book is probably your worst book ever. And you steadily get better and better and better. You have to write probably a million words before all of a sudden it's like, you know what, I could probably do this. You know, And, and I don't think that any author that I've talked to, whether they have, you know, they're just starting to write their book or they've got 50, 60 books out there, ever feels like they're quite good enough. I, I think the, um, the, that first step of writing that first book, whether it be following a trope or whether it be doing something completely original, I think is that first step in, in gathering up the courage to be able to put yourself out in the parking lot bare naked and let everybody critique you. I mean, that's basically what publishing is. Um, you know, it, it takes a lot of courage for somebody to, to actually, you know, take something that they've written that's very personal. And whether you think it's good or not, um, be, putting that out there on Amazon and letting people criticize you for it, you know, letting people read it. You know, I mean, these books are, you know, a lot of these big, uh, starting authors, including myself, you know, you're selling them for 99 cents to, you know, 299, 399, 499, something like that. They're not expensive books to get into. It's not like you have to drive to the bookstore and pick them up anymore. You can just be cruising around on Amazon at night or Kobo or whatever you plan on uh, distributing your book on. And, you know, you see something that, yeah, yeah, I'll put that in my reading list. And all of a sudden you have 40, 50 books that you need to read. That's, that's not a, that's not a bad thing. But I also think that's going to lead to the development of, of more unique authors. I think that, uh, you know, if you see somebody that, that's writing a trope right now, you may see something just utterly fantastic from them four or five years down the road that may blow your mind. I think it's a developmental thing. I think it's just more, I, I, I think the market's getting flooded with with all sorts of books but i also think that it is a developmental thing where as you see the author's journey from one series to another i think they develop 
their writing styles. And I think they develop uh, a little more courage to be able to attack things that uh, our predecessors probably went through in the privacy of their own home, didn't get published. And they finally got something that was really challenging and went out there. I mean, I, I think technology has done that to us so we could actually take and follow certain authors and, and watch it develop. I think you raise an excellent point. Um, and I, I, you know, unfortunately it probably is the rare authors that are, are pushing the boundaries right out of the gate. I've been uh, doing some reading in the police procedural genre for a new project I'm working on. Okay. And um, there are these books called the, uh, uh, the Martin Beck novels. I think it's called The Story of Crime coming I've, out of Sweden. I've seen those. I haven't read them. Yeah. And they're like the first uh, or like one of the first early police procedural, uh, you know, sets of no novels uh, and, and they were kind of opening that, but they're also really political and really getting into like uh, uh, Sweden and how maybe it's a little bit gilded and, and how it's not always living up to these ideals of, of helping the poor and the workers that are often, you know, touted about mm -hmm. Sweden. And so those were authors uh, who, I can't pronounce their names, <laughs> but but who were, <laughs> who were willing to, uh, to, launch a, a genre and also break boundaries. And I think, you know, that's a, that should be the goal, I guess, is more what I'm saying. You're, you're right that, uh, you know, trying to turn people off and, and uh, shout them down if they're not, you know, uh, revolutionizing their genre right away, that's, that's not fair. But we, we don't want to get complacent. You know, we want to be able to, um, to really help our, our readers. And I think that's the goal of every writer. Anybody who writes anything is, is hoping that they, in some way or another, touch the heart of a reader, you know, and they influence, I wouldn't say influence, but they give them something to think about you know, something to kind of metabolize and digest and think, you know what, maybe, maybe my opinion's not quite right on this, or maybe, maybe there's a different perspective, you know, as, as far as that goes. The other thing I was going to say is that in this era of indie authors, uh, indie authoring and um, the markets and, and the way that the internet has connected everybody, we're seeing authors pop up on the U.S. market from all sorts of different countries, you know, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia. You didn't see that 30 years ago. You know, you, you'd be hard pressed to get their books. They'd be in country only. And nowadays you can publish to, you know, I can publish to Germany if I want to and have my books in Germany or in Denmark or, you know, wherever I can hit any one of those Amazon stores or Kobo, um, you know, to get to uh, Canada. I, I think that the um, the transference of knowledge and experience now is is um, especially with li you know literature, current literature. Um, I, I don't think it's ever been this way. And that's something to be really optimistic about, um, because even though uh, there there is a lot of division and a lot of anger at you know at different people being able to read something that was written in uh, in Nigeria or Myanmar or wherever, it, I think it's going to show people if they stick with it, that there's a lot more that unites humanity than divides it. And uh, I think there was a slogan in, in South Africa under apartheid that was like, we all bleed the same color, you know, meaning that yeah. we're, we're all the same on, on the inside. What's going to bring a person pain or joy is going to be kind of similar from one place to another and yet we we do fall into these traps where we don't do right by our fellow humans and uh, maybe being able to read something from someone from a very very different vastly different walk of life is going to be an eye-opening and expanding experience absolutely there are several books that i've read in the past that uh, in the past probably 10 years that I, you know, I, I couldn't imagine getting my hands on before, you know, first I witnessed accounts of human atrocities, you know, or taking those human atrocities and turning it into a, uh, a piece of fiction just to, uh, you know, either protect themselves or protect, uh, you know, the, the people that they love. So they kind of change it a little bit and say, okay, this, you know, this, this is based on real events. 
but it gives you a real insight to some of the uh, some of the uh, glories of the human race and also some of the atrocities, um, which I think is important to record. Right. I think historically, um, you know, like I said, I, I think we're living in a just an incredible time as far as there is more opportunity for disinformation, but I think there's also way more opportunity for us as authors to be able to attack these things uh, in our writing. I like that you use that word attack, but, but well, that sounded wrong. It sounds negative to say attack, but there's are things that are worthy of attack, right? And, and it's always been on the writers to kind of call some of that out, right? To, to expose the things that are wrong, the things that are ill in the world. And, uh, you know, I think that's really important. I call um, it and, yeah. Go ahead. I, I, I call it, I, you know, I, I, I use the, the word attack very carefully because I think that's what we have to do when we're talking about, you know, social issues that are currently burdening us like racism or gay rights or, you know, um, just the uh, um, some of the social shaming or the bullying that's happening or, you know, the you've got your trolls out there that are always, you know, have excellent remarks, not um, on somebody that's trying to make a point, you know, I think we've, you know, somewhat lost the art of debate and, and, and started going down the uh, path of bullying. But I think that uh, with the mediums that we have available to us today, I think that we can actually take on those, those social, social challenges at a, uh, a greater rate, you know, it, instead of taking a year, year and a half to get something published and distributed, I think that if somebody, you know, had a fire lit inside of them because they saw something horrible, they could probably get something written and thrown out there in 45 days. Right. And there's a, there's a balancing act with that because hindsight gives you something, right? Immediacy gives you another advantage. Um, mm -hmm. Careful editing gives you another advantage, right? I, th I think uh, these are all things that people are, are going to have to work with and, and explore. It's interesting uh, that you say trolls, because I know that's a term now, but it, it does also kind of highlight one issue with the, the fantasy genre that I'm hoping to confront a little bit, right? Because okay. in a lot of fantasy novels, you have different races. And like Tolkien describes, I think, orcs as just evil, and they make no beautiful things, and they're bad, and they're, they live in fire, and you know, do mining and, and that's all there is to, to them, right? Mm -hmm. So in that way, the, uh, the fictional universe that's been created there doesn't mirror our own universe where people of different origins and different races are equal and have different and wonderful things to share with the world, right? So there's something almost hard baked into fantasy that fantasy writers have to confront and, and think about, which is like, if if all the goblins are bad or all the trolls are bad, that's really really different from the world of the of the reader, where we don't have just one thing that's going to make readily identifiable evil in any case. I agree uh, somewhat, but I also disagree with you because when you have groups like that in your books, you could be depicting an, a, an entire race, or you could be depicting a group of people you know, instead of trolls, what if you said apartheid, you know, okay, those people are, are not good. Okay. You know, or Nazis or whatever, you know, the Nazis uh, weren't exactly the nicest people on earth either, but. I guess the, the, the difference as I see it is that uh, one, a, a political affiliation is voluntary, whereas a race isn't. So if you're a troll, you're born a troll. If you're a Nazi, you join the Nazi party and that's what makes you that way. Well, if you're, if you're a human, but if you're born into it and, and you're taught from day one that you're going to be this way, you know, we've all seen uh, or read in stories where, you know, there's that one troll that, uh, that breaks the mold and they're actually, you know, a good person and they're excommunicated from the community and the, it's the one person that, it's the one um, uh, character that you're relying on to, uh, you know, be a big part of saving the day. You know, mm -hmm. that type of a thing where, you know, again, I, I think it, uh, you know, it could be taken either way, whether it, uh, you could take it as it's a race of people and they're just not any good, or it could be a, a depiction of a, uh, a group of people 
and especially there's a rebel inside that actually tries to change that group of people. Yeah, again, and I, I don't mean to get too much into into generalizations. Um, sure. I'm, I'm only pointing out that there's a pitfall in the genre that we have to be conscious of, right? And there are writers who, who are awake to it, who try to uh, subvert it. You know, you have the uh, the dissident troll or whatever who's going to join ranks with the, the good guys and, and mm -hmm. set things right. Um, but you don't always see that. And um, sometimes I, I wonder if people aren't um, aware of the, uh, I guess the, the, the burdens that, that go with their, their genre, right? So if you have, um, let, me, let me maybe talk about one project I have on the back burner that I okay. want to try to finish. So uh, the working title is Transfer Phenomenon. I'm not sure if I'm gonna uh, call it that in the future. It's about a, a young uh, amputee who, high school student who wants to win a college scholarship and uh, you know write a dynamite article for a school newspaper and she's trying to track down a reclusive VR pioneer and get an interview so that she'll be able to make this part of her portfolio and college uh, application process and in, and what she finds is that this man has been coerced into designing this uh, VR program that indoctrinates people by casting uh, different um, races as different fantasy races. So if you're immersed in the, the system and the world of the story, you're being slowly acclimated to to see, uh, you know, immigrants as uh, wraiths or trolls and, you know, uh, other minorities as other goblins. And, and she has to, to come to terms, terms with this as a young Latina woman herself, like, this is really bad. The person I was trying to find and looking up to is really uh, involved in something not so good. And uh, she ends up putting herself into that, uh, that world and trying to come out the other side of it. Sure. That, uh, you know, that, that sounds very interesting. Do you have a title for that work yet? I'm thinking transfer phenomena, which was a, a, a term for that kind of um, experience that some people have where the the world of a video game kind of imprints itself on your own mind and gets sure. you thinking that way which is not always a bad thing but um we we have to be careful with some of these new technologies like who's who's making the the world that we're immersing ourselves in right who mm -hmm. what's their agenda is it is it something that we would buy into how hard would it be for someone who doesn't have the best interests of their players or their readers or their students or their workers and, and mind what, what happens. Sure. That, that sounds like a very interesting project. Um, it you. almost sounds like you're going into a uh, RPG type uh, genre. Wrote it and I didn't know it. <laughs> That's very cool. So um, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, Amazon, hopefully. Amazon, <laughs> hope hopefully. Some, hope, some, hope to see some new downloads and, and reviews uh, there pretty soon. Instagram is, is one way I've been trying to kind of pair some quotes from the novel and, uh, you know, other observations and, and notes and connections through that. Torn Veil novel is the, the handle. Um, and it's, it's a work in progress. I know you, you said that you're finding it too, but it takes a while to get yourself out there. And I'm still working on that. Well, hopefully, hopefully this podcast will help you uh, uh, get a little more recognition for your work. I, uh, I, like I said, I think everything that, or this book, uh, Torn Veil, plus your newest project sound very intriguing. Thanks very much. All right. Well, I think at this point in time, uh, I'm going to uh, um, let you say, is there anything that you want to address your readers with or talk one last word for your, uh, for your fans? One final word. Okay, no, no pressure there. No pressure. No, um, just, just wing it, man. Huh. Hmm. Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to do the shameless plug or buy the book or whatever. I, I guess uh, what it boils down to is if you, uh, if you feel this inspiration to write, I don't think people choose to become writers the way they might choose to become a, you know, a dentist or something. If you feel the vocation and the urge to get uh, your words out there and you feel like 
there's something wrong that you could set right by putting it down into a, a short story or a novel, just do it. Just take the plunge. I think that's excellent advice. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and bid everybody a farewell. This is Jeff Bacon with the DIY Writer Podcast. And if you wouldn't mind, subscribe to my YouTube channel or follow me on iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify or any place else where you happen to download your podcast and listen. And hopefully you've enjoyed this show. I hope you all have a wonderful day.